Mac. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that uh, we're all on uh, Aboriginal lands um, that have been unceded. Uh, I'm joining from uh, the lands of the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nation. I'd like to acknowledge their elders past and present. Look, also like to thank Donna Hannon for joining us. Uh, and note, I think this is Bill Swanee's first um, time at Sidron as well. So I'm not sure if there's anyone else who's here for the first time, but uh, yeah, welcome. Uh, it's glorious to have you all here. And it's an honor for us to have uh, Diane Hall presenting today. Uh, Diane's uh, a wonderful scholar and leader here at VU. Uh, she's recently written a glorious book, uh, A New History of the Irish in Australia, with Elizabeth Malcolm. And Diane is also one of the deputy directors of the VU Institute for Sustainable Industries and Livable Cities, as well as an editor of the Austral Australasian Journal of Irish Studies, a member of the executive of the Irish Studies Association of Australia and New Zealand, a member of the Victorian University Feminist Research Network, and one of the co-conveners of the Melbourne Irish Studies Seminar Series. So I'd like to hand over to Diane. Great. Thanks very much, Matthew, for that, um, for that introduction. I'll just get my PowerPoint up and let's hope the technology um, continues to be kind. There we go. Can you all see that okay? Yeah, good. All right, now I'll just try and make sure that it works the way I want it to. Excellent. Okay. Is that working for you all? Yeah? Good. We've got the right. presenter view on though. All right. Oh, damn. I don't want presenter view. View slideshow. Is that better? Hang on. Now all my screens have gone blank. Is that better? Yeah, that's it. Great. That's what I want. Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody, for asking me to come and talk today. Um, this is this is really a good thing to be doing, to be sharing this with you. I have shared a little bit of this research uh, that I've done on the history of the Irish in Australia before, uh, and this is a development on that. So if you if you were there at one of those earlier talks a couple of years ago, this is slightly this is different material. Um, my paper today has grown from the research, as Matthew said, um, that Elizabeth Malcolm and I did for a new history of the Irish in Australia, which we published uh, late 2018, early 2019. And that was initially funded by the Australian Research Council through a discovery project grant. Um, so I want to start today with two images. Okay. Uh, with two images of an Irish woman and an Indigenous Australian man. In April 1899, the popular Australian illustrated magazine, The Bulletin, published a small cartoon titled A Misapprehension by the successful Irish-Australian artist Tom Durkin. In this cartoon, Durkin depicts Mrs Muldoon talking to King Billy. Mrs Muldoon has typically Irish simianised features, speaks with an exaggerated accent, while showing her ignorance of common usage of racial terms, seeming to be indignant at the suggestion that her son might be considered not as good as a black wretch like King Billy. Over a hundred years later, an Irish woman and an indigenous man were also connected through popular media in the film, The Nightingale, uh, set in the Tasmanian convict settlement of 1825. This 2019 film depicts the brutal assault of the Irish speaking convict woman Claire, played by Irish actor Ashling Franciosi, and her journey to take revenge on her English army attackers, aided by Indigenous man Billy, played by Lungu actor Bakali Ganambar. Mrs. Muldoon's interactions with King Billy were published on the eve of Federation of the Australian Colonies in a context of anxiety and debate over inclusion and exclusion in the new nation. The Nightingale was released, of course, in a very different context at the beginnings of Australian acknowledgement of its histories of race and oppression in the histories of our nationhood. The choice by director Jennifer Kent to show colonial racial and sexual violence from the perspective of an Irish convict woman 
arguably occupying the lowest rung of the nascent white society, allows her to interrogate the heterogeneity of white settlement. It also references the widespread belief among many Australians of Irish descent that their ancestors were less culpable than the English in the racist policies and practices of colonisation. However, the reality is more complex. As Michael D. Higgins, President of Ireland, acknowledged in one of his first speeches in an official tour of Australia in 2017, when he spoke to the Western Australian Parliament in Perth. And he said, we must acknowledge that there are some among their number, the Irish, who inflicted injustice too. The we um, not only included the most powerful, it also included all elements of society who had participated or acquiesced. It had to include, we must recognise some who were Irish in Australia too. So what I want to do today is, is look at one element of that complexity um, by examining how Irish Australians were represented in popular media and culture, particularly cartoons, plays and films, with it, when they're in the same frame as other racialized groups, particularly First Nations people, as well as Chinese Australians. So just a, a little bit of background um, uh, for those who who may not know, by 1901, the year of federation, uh, the six former British colonies that formed the Federation Nation of Australia had approximately 25% of the white population of either Irish birth or descent. This means Australia had, the, had a higher percentage of Irish in the white population than either of the other two major diasporic destinations for the Irish, which is the United Kingdom um, or the United States. The first wave of European arrivals was between 1788 and 1868, and the Irish were a significant minority as both convicts sent to the newly instituted penal colonies and as members of the British Army guarding them. The second wave of Irish Australians, uh, Irish arrivals were those who chose to migrate as free settlers um, from the 1840s onwards, many taking advantage of various government sponsored assistance schemes and attracted by reports of gold, easily acquired land or employment. Um, majority of the Irish who arrived were Catholic, but approximately 20 to 25% were Protestants. All of these Irish migrants traveled not only the great physical distance between Ireland and the Australian colonies, they also moved into a distinctly colonial landscape that was very different to the one that they had come from. This one was where there was a Catholic minority rather than the majority in Ireland, among a majority Protestant, English and Scottish white population. These English and Scots settlers, fellow convicts and soldiers had brought with them their own racialized ideas expressed in discriminatory practices and, wide, and a wide ranging repertoire of anti-Irish stereotypes. But the Irish traveling to the colonies at the same time moved to a place that was forged, of course, through the violent dispossession of indigenous peoples and the eventual exclusion of non-European peoples justified by theories of race and racial hierarchies. So in many ways, the Irish people in colonial Australia occupied a liminal position in white popular imaginings. For many Protestant settlers, the colonies represented an opportunity to build a new society free of the um, religious divisions of the old world. To this end, there were explicit policies of religious freedoms and there were explicit uh, policies of uh, making sure that there were churches of all denominations in even the smallest town. Yet for all the rhetoric of equality and freedom, ideas of racial and religious hierarchies profoundly shaped colonial societies. Now, there, there was real discrimination against particularly Catholic Irish in 19th and early 20th century white Australia. And although I won't talk about the specifics of that today, what I do want to talk about is the it was underpinned by popular culture in the form of visual imagery of caricatures and cartoons, verbal puns and jokes in newspapers, plays and novels, and eventually film. At the same time as this very important strand of racialized anti-Irishness pervaded much popular culture, 
There was, of course, a counter narrative that valorised the Irish as rebels that harked back to an island tinged with nostalgia and gleefully laughed at the discomfiture of the English and respectable people in general. Cartoons and caricatures such as those published in uh, the print media depended for their success on a shared understanding of a defined range of images and words to convey complex meanings. Uh, physical appearance was very much believed to be representative of inner moral worth uh, throughout this period. And so caricatures that portrayed peoples um, in ways that were different to an assumed norm were meant to convey meaning. For the humour inherent in each caricature to work, these stereotypes had to be easily recognised but still capable of infinite variation. Um, cartoonists like Durkin and the Bulletin star cartoonist um, Lin Livingston Hopkins or Hop used stereotype racial caricature characteristics to satirise Chinese, First Nations people and Jews as well as Irish in the cartoons. And here's just a couple of them, really. And you can see in this one by Durkin from 1895, the simianized features of the Irish man. He looks a bit like a chimpanzee, really. Um, with astute overhanging brow, receding jaw, eyes close together and low slung ears. Durkin was particularly adept at exaggerating physical characteristics to depict and satirise racial differences. And these enduring characteristics of Irishness built also on a long tradition of the Irish joke or Irish bull, um, which was told at the, which is a sort of a verbal pun, told at the expense of the stupid Irish peasants and domestic servants. Now, Durkin himself is an interesting character because he was himself Irish um, and born on the ship coming out here. And in many ways, he typifies the, the journey to respectability of middle-class Irish Australians who um, seem to be wanting to distance themselves from the very racialized Irish characteristics that might um, depict their Irish parents. I've got another one here. Yeah, and here's some more particularly of women, um, Irish women servants in particular in these cartoons are shown to be uh, in a particular way, very much similar to the uh, Simeonized features as well as that they're very stupid usually. Many of the popular performances, jokes, plays and stories that relied on these caricatypes and stereotypes had already, already had success elsewhere in the English speaking world. And we find them very much not only in cartoons, but also in popular plays. And these are the plays that aren't the sort of highbrow plays. These are the um, popular theatre of the burlesque and minstrel shows um, that were uh, popular with Australian audiences even when critics were perhaps less enthusiastic. Uh, for example, the Melbourne Weekly Times in 1872 was decidedly tepid in its praises of a Melbourne production of an Irish play or sort of stereotyped Irish play called Innes Phelan. The, re the reviewer queried the stock characters and the acting saying that, um, saying that the honest, good-natured, bull-making peasant with his modest and lovely sweetheart was characterised by a poor attempt at an Irish brogue, a most evidently counterfeit article, but it still played to sold out audiences. Some of the most popular theatrical performances in colonial and early Federation Australia were, as I said, variety and minstrel shows, incorporating songs, dances and sketched loosely, sometimes extremely loosely, organised around a narrative or a story. Many of the stories and themes were similar to performances in the UK and the US, and the same companies toured throughout the English speaking world in the 19th and 20, early 20th century, usually though employing some local cast members. These performances relied on easily recognized satirical and caricatured characters, including Jewish, African-American, Chinese, and Irish. Some characters were based on well-known imagery, storylines, costumes, and accents, that were instantly recognisable, although capable of um, local variation. Stock Irish characters were common in variety in minstrel shows, 
And particularly when they're merging of several racialized stereotypes in the same character, particularly while performing in blackface or while corking, as it was called. And here's a picture of an unidentified actor. I'm not totally sure what he's trying to be playing, but it's from a collection of um, a minstrel show director, Nat Phillips, probably from the 30s, 20s or 30s. Um, Larrikins were particularly uh, common in these, uh, a particularly Australian feature of these minstrel shows. They're typically defined as lower class streetwise petty criminals distinguished by their distinctive dress and speech as much as by their irreverent mischief making and many had Irish connections. There's one that was in the early 20th century included a song of the Sydney suburb Woolloomooloo sung to the well-known Irish tune Killaloo replacing the original words with verses about a Sydney streetwise urban larrikin with an Irish name, McCarty. Um, songs such as this were often actually performed in blackface. Um, and as Melissa Belanta, who's a scholar who's worked on larrikins has demonstrated, there were multiple links in the popular press between the perceived lawlessness of the larrikin with savages. So fusing fellow urban outcasts who were often Irish or of Irish descent with blackface portrayals furthered the racialized link already common in American minstrel performances between lower class Irish and black Americans. Other minstrel pieces linked ethnical racial outsiders together by use of accents or dress. And in the early decades of the 20th century, um, up until the mid 20th century, I think they were still performing, comedians Nat Phillips wrote popular reviews with the characters Stiffy and Mo in which he played Stiffy, and Jewish Australian comedian uh, who was known by his stage name of Roy Reen, but was born Harry van der Sluis, played Mo McPherson. And he described that character as being half Irish and half Hebrew. There are a few extant descriptions of these acts, but it is probable that Reen played physical, used physical Irishisms along with Jewish accents in his characterization of Mo. Surviving scripts indicate that physical performances were supported by songs based on local events, such as one called Solicitor Charlie Grief has become a member of the Celtic Club, which was loosely based on reports, whoops, sorry, which is loosely based on reports that Jewish high profile lawyer in Perth had become a member of the local Celtic Club in the 1920s. The song provides a back, an imagined backstory genealogy for Charlie where he is from the O'Griffin family from Kildare who went to Jerusalem and joined the Noses. And that's just the final verse there that gives you a bit of a um, feel for the type of humour that was extremely popular at the time. Imagining characters somehow unable to control urges imagined as part of their mixed race or ethnicity was not uncommon in popular stage shows at the time. And there's another one of the popular, well, it was performed many times by amateur theatre groups um, between 1914 and 1927 of an American play called Patsy O. Wang. Um, it was specifically written to be performed by amateur groups and the humour of the play was centred on the main character, a cook who is described as half Chinese and half Irish, who when he drinks tea is the docile Chinese Chin Sum, speaking in broken English, but is transformed into wild Irish accented Patsy O'Wang when he drinks whiskey. That both Irish and Chinese were equally foreign in the way that they were perceived in Australian white society was underlined by cartoons such as this one by Durkin from 1896. Now, while audiences in Australia clearly appreciated the humour of these stereotypes, the Irish Catholic press was not quite so amused and they condemned minstrel shows, depictions of Irishness, and was scathing of audience appreciation of the stage Irishman. Um, and there was a review of a play by Irish American entertainer, Alan Doon, which appeared in the bulletin and was illustrated by this cartoon, which shows the simianized faces of audience members 
and both the uh, Australian advocate uh, the Irish Australian Catholic newspaper The Advocate as well as Alan Doon um, protested volubly about this cartoon being used to libel a malicious and unjust libel of the Irish race. Now, Irish Australians um, themselves, while rejecting racialised stereotypes of themselves as Irish, generally accepted racialised caricatures of Chinese and Indigenous peoples. Um, and so now I'll, so I've sort of gone, gone over what the racialised caricatures and stereotypes were of the Irish. And now I want to move on to when they were put in the same frame, so to speak, as either Chinese um, or Indigenous peoples. Um, so Irish Australians themselves generally accepted and were supportive of the white Australia policies around federation. Um, oops. Underlying much of the um, participation of Irish Australians in riots and violence directed at Chinese on the gold fields, uh, for example, was fear that the Chinese would unfairly compete with them for jobs and wives. Um, and there's a series of cartoons, poems and commentary published in the latter years of the 19th century that positioned um, Irish women as racially superior to Chinese men. The short-lived but popular Melbourne-based newspaper, The Ant, and then its success, The Bull Ant, which were owned, edited, and largely written and illustrated by Tom Durkin, featured a number of these pieces, um, including a poem about a fictional laundryman, Wang Tart's courtship of Biddy, an Irish servant. And you can see just a little bit of that poem there, where she, in her rejection of him, couches this in racial, terms of racial hierarchies based on African-American characters from the popular stage. Black Joe was a popular um, blackface character on minstrel shows at the time. A few years later, Tom Durkin contributed one of his biting caricatures to the bulletin. In this cartoon, he displayed a Chinese man in the witness box of court, closest to the viewer, and complete with stereotyped menacing facial characteristics, as well as you can see there, the, um, I would suggest that the way that the um, dog is portrayed is a bit snake-like there. Uh, so he's, he's certainly being seen as being very sinister. And he uses widely understood Irish stereotypes to, to also stereotype the cheerful Simeonized Clancy in the dock and then to undermine the respectability of the Irish magistrate, assuming the readers would understand the impossibility that respectable Irish Australian Clancy, JP, would ever agree to one of his daughters marrying a Chinese man. These sorts of images also point to the way Irish Australians were joining in the chorus of voices clamouring for restrictions on coloured labour, enthusiastically supporting white Australia policies in letters to the editors of the um, Catholic newspapers, voting for Irish Australian politicians who are outspoken in their support for immigration restrictions. And although we could certainly find individual exceptions, overall there was widespread support among Irish Australians for restricted entry to Australia based on race at this time. Now, I've talked a bit about cartoons and imagery of the Irish and the Chinese around the time of Federation. What I haven't really talked about is, is, is finding the same sort of images of Indigenous Australians. And this is because there aren't that many of them that put racialised Irish and racialised Indigenous people in the same cartoons. This is um, a little bit unexpected because there certainly were cartoons that racialised and denigrated Indigenous peoples throughout the 19th century. But they often, it's a, it's a little bit harder to find them in the same frame with, with um, uh, characterised, caricatured Irish. Um, just show, this is one of the ones that I have found. Um, and it's by another Irish Australian cartoonist, Frank Marnie, called The Child of Nature. And it shows an Irishman, uh, Ryan, Pat Ryan, chasing Indigenous uh, peoples away from his pub. 
He's shouting at the two people who are depicted as wild and violent. His Irishness is represented by his speech patterns and his name, but not necessarily by his physical features. Billy, on the other hand, is overtly visually coded as an Aboriginal man by his physical features, his name, his speech and his violent actions. Marnie's Pat Ryan's attitude towards Billy was echoed in Irish Australian participation in active dispossession of Indigenous people, as well as the quieter, more common racism of neglect and discrimination, none of which were readily discussed in popular culture. In fact, Attempts to treat both Indigenous and Irish cultures together and sympathetically were usually greeted with scorn by Irish Australians in this, in this period, this turn of the century period. An example of this in the first decade of the 20th century, Daisy Bates, who was a controversial and decidedly eccentric Irish woman who lived for many years in Central Australia with Indigenous peoples. She gave a series of lectures in Perth in which she linked the Aboriginal people she knew sympathetically with Irish Catholics in the way they used their weapons and in the sense of connectedness to land. Perth-based Irish Australians, though, were swift to condemn her and published letters in uh, newspapers declaring that Bates had stooped to insult a large section of the community by comparing the despised blackfellow with the Irish. Okay, so now I want to move on a bit to some of the more, um, to move on in time a bit, to look at some of the uh, nostalgic views that the Irish have started to publish themselves. Uh, and then I'll move on to looking at some films. Um, so the caricature, although the caricatures of the Irish continued throughout the early to mid 20th century, there was also a swell of narratives, songs, plays and films that celebrated a different version of Irishness, loyal, rebellious, humorous and happy to bring down the pretensions of the English. Just said Hanrahan is, is just, one, um, uh, just one version of, of a, a popular, very popular poem by the Irish Australian um, author who was a um, John O'Brien, that was the pen name of the priest, Patrick Hartigan. Okay. The other, of course, is Ned Kelly, young, charismatic Irish Australian turned bushranger, caught and executed for murder in 1880. And he's held an extraordinary place in the Australian imagination, even from before his death. His quixotic justifications of his actions are preserved in the two dictated letters known as the Cameron and Gerildery letters, which um, bring to the fore the overt discrimination he and his family had suffered at the hands of the police, although he doesn't notice most, it doesn't really go into the fact that most of them were also Irish born. Ned Kelly's stories with all its overtones of oppression of the underdog and sentimentalized Irishness has been entwined within Australian popular culture since he started his career with ballads, cartoons, stories, films, plays, novels, and tourist attractions, such as the great big statue at Glen Rowan, telling and retelling his story. Now, bringing the discussion uh, more clearly to the, to the present, since the 1970s, Australians with Irish heritage have ex also been exploring their ancestry, and some have been linked uh, the contemporary political situation in Northern Ireland during the Troubles with other decolonising movements, including the struggle for Aboriginal rights in Australia. This in turn has led some, some Australians of Irish descent to see Irish settlers and convicts as having relatively benign connections with Indigenous peoples during the colonising processes as both groups had been oppressed by the British. Exploration of the themes of the Irish as outsider, as outlaw, and connected through this status with Indigenous people have appeared in several films and television programs um, over the past decade or so. And I'll just talk about um, one television show and then go on to talk about The Nightingale. There are others, um, such as particularly the, um, the proposition, but I won't talk about that today. 
The television series Glitch, I don't know if any of you saw it. It was a sort of gothic horror, you know, small town Australian um, story that was uh, shown on the ABC between 2015 and 2019. It centres on a small rural Australian town where people who died many years before uh, mysteriously rise alive from their graves. And it's long and complicated narrative. However, one of the storylines involves Paddy Fitzgerald, played by Irish actor Ned Dennehy, a 19th century Irish-born owner of the town's only hotel. Paddy had what was depicted in the series as a romantic extramarital relationship with Kalinda, played by Yungo actor Leela Gorowiwi. His white 21st century descendants in the town violently disapprove of Paddy's relationship with Kalinda and try to ensure that Paddy and Kalinda's Indigenous grandchildren cannot inherit the substantial estate. Here the Irish-born 19th century Paddy shown as empathetic and warm towards Kalinda and their grandchildren, while the 21st century white grandsons are greedy, violent and racist. This is a narrative that many Irish Australians would find familiar and perhaps comforting. Their ancestors were kind and supportive of the Indigenous peoples, while it is present day Australians who are the racists. The recent film exploration of Irish and Indigenous identities and connections is in The Nightingale, directed by Jennifer Kent. As I said at the beginning, this is set in during the uh, period known as the Black Wars in 1825 in Tasmania. It centres on the brutalisation of Irish convict Clare and the systemic violence against Indigenous peoples by the English army. The film makes explicit connections between the experiences of Clare and Billy, who guides her through the unforgiving Tasmanian landscape so she can enact, enact her revenge. Initially, she is contemptuous of him, saying, I am not travelling with a black. Do I want to end up in a pot? And then as she learns to trust him, she underlines the commonality of their sufferings at the hand of the English white man. And I just want to show you a couple of clips. The first one is from what I hope will be the trailer. You know what it's like to have a white fella take everything you have, don't you? To buy my love. Oops. The film uses, um, so that, that's a very explicit connection between the, the Irish experience at the hands of the British and um, her view, at least, of what uh, Billy and his people have experienced. The film uses language, amongst other things, to mark Claire and Billy's separateness from the English. And now I just want to show you a little bit from the end of the movie when Billy sings in language while Claire sings in Irish. And let's hope this works. Uh, there we go. I'm still here, and I'm not going nowhere. Me now, I fall, and I'm in my life, and I'm in my life. I'm in my life, I'm in my life, I'm in my life, I'm in my
Hombre, te tira la mano. While many critics have praised the unflinching betrayal of gendered and racial colonial violence in this film, along with the careful and layered portrayal of the Indigenous peoples during the period of the Black Wars, they have tended to accept the implicit equivalence between Claire and Billy as both victims of English colonial violence. Eulalie and Kamalore lawyer, academic novelist and filmmaker Larissa Berendt, however, has critiqued this equivalent, equivalence, writing in her review, in the end, there is no way to escape your own complicity when you are part of the colonial system, no matter how powerless you yourself are. Irish Clare, racialised, discriminated against and brutalised by the English colonisers, also played a part in the violent disposition, dispossession of the Indigenous peoples, however unwittingly. At the end of the film, Claire lives to, fight, to face another day, however uncertain that day looked, while Billy died at the hands of the English army officer. In conclusion, the depictions of Irishness and race in Australian popular culture in the latter 19th century and 20th century are multi-layered. Racialized stereotypes of Irishness circulated in Australia just as they did in the rest of the English speaking Irish diaspora. Cartoons of simianized men and stupid women were popular and endlessly reproduced and underpined real discrimination against Irish people and their children, particularly through employment. These stereotypes were also hugely popular on the stage in plays, variety, musical, and minstrel shows giving Australian audiences access to similar characters honed in performances in North America and England. The specificities of Australian racial hierarchies were also woven within popular culture with both Chinese and Irish stereotypes being fodder for racially based humour. Irish Australians developed their distinctive cultural contributions and sense of belonging to emerging white Australian identities and as part of that were enthusiastic proponents of early 20th century restrictions on immigration. When Irish people were in the same frame though as Indigenous people, they're usually coded as uncomplicatedly white and British. Many Irish Australians were also either active or complicit in the dis dispossession and oppression of Indigenous peoples. And understand, oops, not quite there. An understanding of Irish history, though it has led many modern Irish Australians to take comfort from the fact that their ancestors were also oppressed by the English and therefore would not have been as involved in the violence of the frontier as the English. These connections, though, are starting to, and these connections are starting to be explored in contemporary Australian film. Placing First Nations people's suffering and trauma into the historical past is of course essential and not yet taken as seriously as it should be in the white Australian imagination. As modern Australia starts to grapple with its contested colonial past, the place of the Irish in that past needs to be considered in all its multi-layered complexity. Films like The Nightingale are starting to explore this. Historians of Irish Australia also need to speak up and argue that Catholic Irish settlers were certainly a group who were often racialised, brutalised and discriminated against were part of the colonial project. 
As part of this, we need to highlight how some Irish enthusiastically took the journey from being colonised and oppressed in Ireland to becoming violent colonisers in Australia. While traces of this journey may be more shadowy in 19th and early 20th century popular culture than the overtly simianized Irish comic features, such traces do exist. Certainly celebrated bulletin cartoonist Hop and his editors knew of this in 1897 when they published this cartoon of Kieran Dalton and the Irish Catholic priest who knowingly joked about Dalton's sexual exploitation of Indigenous women. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane, for that uh, compelling and thought-provoking paper. We've got 15 minutes before you have to dash for questions and comments. Who would like to start? I'm sorry, I've only just seen the, com the comments and realised you couldn't see the videos. <laughs> but you're sorry, oh, I do apologise for that. I thought I had ticked all the relevant boxes. The, uh, the soundscape from them was still. Uh, the soundscape was probably the most important thing, but it's a shame you didn't see the beautiful pictures as well. So I do apologise. I might start off with a question then. I'm interested, um, partly informed by um, Chelsea Watergo's amazing mansion piece. Um, from uh, the end of last week, but um, kind of she, one of the things she talks about is this kind of eternal quest, oh, the kind of quest for innocence in, of those mm -hmm. understood of as white. And it, it seems to me that, that that's kind of a, one of the frames which one can understand these, these Irish Australians kind of seeking a kind of redemptive innocence uh, rather than, um, engaging and kind of working with their complicity. Does, does that kind of seem like a lens that might be useful? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thanks, Matthew. Um, I think that that is one of the things that's happening. And it is, of course, complicated by um, the fact that we, we actually don't have a, a lot of research on relationships um, between Irish and Indigenous peoples in all their complexity um, in the past. Uh, in the chapter in our book, we, we go one step in that direction, but it is it's just one step. Um, and as we say in, in that chapter, there, there are, there's good evidence that there were uh, successful loving families formed between usually Irish men and Indigenous women as well as met a lot of evidence of, of very um, exploitative relationships as well. Um, and one of the things that, that I've talked about in the past is um, uh, if you go onto the, um, the massacre map, that, that, that wonderful resource, um, and just click on some of the sites and the, the little snippets of information that they have and look at the names of a lot of the police, uh, the colonial police are, of course, hugely Irish dominated. Um, and that, that hasn't really been explored um, as yet. And it is, would certainly be a topic that's worth more explanation, um, more exploration. Um, that, you know, that there, there was a lot of involvement of people of Irish descent in various ways in dispossession. And that hasn't really been uh, examined with by historians, but it also hasn't really entered into the popular imaginary of what Irish Australia was. Um, um, hi, that was just incredible. I'm so interested in that. Um, I did my post up my doctoral research in Ireland, looking at the other situation of, of the rewhitening of the Irish mm. in the 2012, you know, in that sort of Irish Celtic tiger. But just returning to that issue of the race for innocence, one, I'm a feminist scholar, feminist post-colonial scholar, and there's a lot of also that recuperation, attempts to recuperate from the white feminist Irish, you know, mm -hmm. to say that it was the men, it was the patriarchy, mm -hmm. when in fact, um, I'm sorry, I'm outside and my neighbor's just into his garage. Um, that recuperation, I mean, that, that comes from feminist literature, the race for innocence, you know, with Doreen Razak and 
um, fellows. And that is a really important omission in, in all scholarship. First of all, because it leaves out the feminist angle, but second of all, feminists don't want to go there either. And a lot of like, there's all that sort of work about sexiles, you know, people that weren't allowed to, the second later part of colonization, women in Ireland and in England weren't allowed to have property, they weren't allowed to work. So they migrated in that second round in order to be able to run ranches and, and also um, lesbian women who couldn't be lesbian in Ireland. So that whole sex aisles is quite an interesting thing as well. So the place of women in that colonization in terms of the domesticity and the missionary, it's not really examined at all. Um, but that was such an incredible, like I'm just to see, to have that all that collected, it's such a great uh, chapter to be recording and to have access to that visual. But the other, and and, and there's just a, about the, um, yeah, no, that, that's all I wanted to say. It was really, really enjoyable and it really fills in a lot of gaps that can be now, you know, joined up a little bit more to have research like that. Thanks. Thanks, Melanie. Um, yes, I mean, the, the role of women in all of this is, is also uh, very, very interesting and, and little explored. Um, often, you know, uh, feminist histories of domesticity and respectability and in um, of in Australian colonial history, and even when it's examined, um, even when it is unpicked with Indigenous servants and that sort of exploitation, it it doesn't it homogenises the the white women, um, and they they're all British. They they don't differentiate really often um, between them, and perhaps that's the the right thing to do. They're certainly all acting um, in a similar in a similar way, um, and it, it is a little bit hard to dis, to disentangle it. Um, I've done a little bit of work on that in that chapter in the book that does explicitly look at um, women, particularly women who employed uh, servants. Um, and there was a lot of Irish women who employed servants as well. So yes, there's a lot of work still to be done to really understand the multi layers of what's going on, or yeah. what was going on there. Yeah. But also outside of the servant narrative, like when you look at Indigenous histories, you see all the political activism, the letter writing, mm. all that stuff that Foley is doing. And um, Tony Birch and it's like all that evidence so you only get to see them in the servant domestic frame versus the political anti-colonial kind of activism of Indigenous women you know they get sort of trapped in that yeah and yeah. the other thing I wanted to say was I personally know um, a long term like right back from 18 something my Indigenous colleague her mother's Irish and mm. they, for generations, Aboriginal women have married Irish and lived in the, mm. you know, so there are such beautiful examples. Oh, there are. Absolutely, there, there are. are. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So there are. There's no question the that there are. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, it's, and, and that's, a, that's a really positive, uh, you know, we, we could see that as a really positive thing, but um, well, I think that's been what's, what's what uh, Irish strains have sort of hung on to that. Or tended to, in, and I'm generalising, rather than look at the darker side of it. Yeah. Um, you mean the positive side in terms of like recuperating the racial oppression? That, uh, that, that they that they were that they there were some people who um, did have respectful, loving relationships, um, and and that sustaining ones. Absolutely, there were. There's no question yeah. about that. And and what I'm feeling is when that kind of stuff comes out, it, because race isn't dealt with in this country, not properly, when that comes out, it, it looks like a recuperative move. Mm. Oh, we had some happy family. You know, that's mm. probably why it's rejected. I would, re you know, and maybe we don't go there because of that as well. So until like the feminist, you know, scholarship has actually totally embedded and embraced race and colonialism, they're not going to be able to deal with telling that story the way it should be told, those stories in the spectrum, you know. Anyway, I, I've mm -hmm. talked too much, but that was just brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have questions or comments? Um, Diane, just one from me, and it, I guess it's focusing on the the role of the Irish and the, um, you know, I guess setting up the religious and educational structures within Australia in that in that time, and I guess that re well well 
creating that colonial um, system structure through religion and, and through education and and I guess the Irish role in that I mean it was quite profound um, mm. so what what sort of work has has analysis has happened around around that Diane uh, there has been some work being done on our, on Catholic missionaries, um, missionaries within Indigenous communities. Um, but it's important to note that the vast majority, well, not the vast majority, but the majority of missionary activity up until the, uh, the early decades of the 20th century was actually in Protestant missions, not Catholic missions. And that there are complex reasons for that to do with the church hierarchy, but um, that that most of them were Protestant. Some of some of them Irish Protestant missionaries, but but they were Protestant to do with Protestant churches. Um, that though that you do get Catholic missionaries and Catholic uh, missionaries running um, running the the homes for Indigenous children in the latter parts of the twentieth century. Mm -hmm. um, definitely, uh, you, the education system is is interesting because um, actually the a lot of the state education systems were based on the Irish national system, national school system itself, um, as well as of course the Catholic school system, but based very much on what was happening in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Some of those educational materials that we used you can trace relatively benign ways of looking at um, looking at indigenous peoples uh, that we're all God's children and we should respect God's children and indigenous peoples look after their families and things like that um, which is I would you know certainly sets people up for, for a better foundation perhaps if we're if we're looking at it in a hierarchy um, so, so it is important and no, no, although there has been done on on Irish missionaries there's been done on Irish education and there's been done on Irish religious move, uh, orders not a lot on their interactions with the indigenous peoples per se mm. um, that, that that is a thread that hasn't gone through it very much there is a wonderful documentary that I don't think is available I mean it was shown here and it's been shown in film festivals which was made by an Australian Irish Australian woman with um, Irish poet who lived here for a long time and interviewed a whole lot of people, including Gary Foley. Um, and that was great at exploring some of some of those things. And it would be great if that film could get a bit of better distribution. Yeah. You don't have the name of it, Dar uh, Dar Yeah, it's Andulf Gale. Sorry? Andulf Gale. Andulf Gale. Yeah. I can send you the, the name of it and the That's director. So, yeah, I have asked her for permission to, to show bits of it and she's basically said no. Oh. <laughs> she, <laughs> I've got a copy of it, but um, yeah. I've asked to use it in teaching and stuff and she says, well, she'd love to, but we'd need to pay her, <laughs> which is understandable <laughs> if she doesn't have any money. <coughs> okay, thank you again um, for that uh, really interesting discussion um, following. Um, your fascinating paper, Diane. Uh, we will let everyone go, um, but news first. Um, we have uh, another seminar coming up uh, in a couple of weeks um, with Gabriela Tavara, talking about transitional justice from the bottom up. And next Thursday, we thought uh, school holidays in Victoria um and uh, the week between teaching so uh we thought we would have some drinks on thursday afternoon as well and just a gathering for those who would like to gather more socially given that we still can't catch up in person so uh please come along to that should you wish to and also to the next seminar and thank you all for being here again Oh, thanks. Oh, sorry, Chris. No, right? no, no. I was just going to say thanks. Thanks too. Thanks, Matthew. And thank, thank you very much, Diane, for doing that. I, I think I'm always, always um, inspired about the archival retrieval and revisiting archives and I guess the possibilities of deracializing or thinking, um, deconstructing whiteness and all of those sorts of possibilities that comes out of doing this sort of work and how important that is, I think, for this current moment of of unsettling and reimagining race relations in Australia and glo globally. So I think the work that the <laughs> that comes out of history is, is really amazing and and really powerful as we as and specifically as as we think about um, 
at, at VU and like, I, I guess beyond. Um, I guess the, the broader thing around protecting country and how um, race relations is such a central um, part of, 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 of that project. And then I guess the, the archive in terms of that reimagining. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. I really appreciate it. And I'd, I'd also yeah. like to uh, thank Prashani for, for setting up this <laughs> seminar and, and all our other seminars this, this year. Thanks everyone, That's I've got to go to my next now. meeting, but that was